thank you so much, Phil. Um, yeah, it is a special weekend for us. 30 years ago, Anna and I were at, uh, both at the Evangelical Theological College of Wales, and we'd been, we met there, and we'd been going out for, I don't know, nine months. And uh, we went swimming in Bridgend at the um, swimming pool there. We went to Cowbridge Road Chippy, got fish and chips for our tea, and then sitting in the lounge in the house where Anna was um, uh, sharing uh, that evening, uh, a question was popped and a question was uh, answered and accepted, and that was 25th September 1992. So that's 30 years ago tomorrow. So we're really glad to be. When Phil said, could you come down that weekend? Well, that was a no-brainer. But uh, for other reasons, we're glad to be here as well. I'm really glad to uh, be able to share uh, in this session. And uh, please do, if you've got comments, questions, thoughts that we can share together uh, afterwards uh, in our discussion time, that would be really uh, very helpful. Uh, well, I guess sometimes at the beginning of a talk, a speaker has to contend for uh, the view that they want to put forward, maybe about how things are in society, in the culture, uh, in people's lives, and whether that's the church or more broadly. Um, but I think I can happily say this morning that I don't feel under any such compulsion uh, in what I want to uh, say to us as uh, pertains to the situation around us. And that is that quiet hearts are rare. Quiet hearts are rare amongst us today. And they're scarce not simply in uh, society, but also in the church and I don't think it's controversial to say that or that it needs to be established in one way or another. Uh, I haven't got statistics to give to you anyway, uh, but I would be very surprised if you didn't say, I feel that and I see that. If you don't feel that, if you don't see that, then uh, by all means, uh, make a counter case uh, later when we're discussing things together. But it does strike me that uh, anecdotally, the evidence is there it does stare us in the face. And you might say, it actually stares me back in the mirror. I know I don't have a quiet heart. I know that there is turbulence uh, within me. Huge numbers of people, it seems. When you, you don't even have to read books, let alone a 400-page book, uh, but just read the articles, read the posts that people uh, put up online. Huge numbers of people are struggling with disquiet within with dis-ease within them. Uh, it's palpable, and the impact of it, it can't be ignored. Uh, there is so much discontent. Tension is rampant within us and around us. Many relationships are in trouble. Many relationships have been severed uh, around this whole area. Uh, so many people experiencing burnout. Levels of anxiety are sky high. Uh, especially amongst younger people, but not simply with uh, younger people. Thinking about it in terms of ministry and the significance of having quiet hearts, um, some 40 years ago now, it was actually 1981, uh, Eugene Peterson wrote a piece that was carried in uh, Leadership Today. It was then published in a book of collected uh, articles by him called The Contemplative Pastor. Uh, and the piece was called The Unbusy Pastor. And it's so helpful. Uh, if, you can, if you've got the book, you can read it there. Uh, if you think, I don't want to pay out for a book. I'm forgetting for a moment, I'm not in Yorkshire. You're probably more generous down here. But uh, if you don't want to, to pay to get the book, just search it online. Eugene Peterson, Unbusy Pastor, Leadership Today, Christianity Today website, you'll find it. Anyway, here's part of what he said uh, in that article. And it still rings so true today. I'm reflecting on unquiet hearts in terms of ministry. He said, if I vainly crowd my day with conspicuous activity or let others fill my day with imperious demands, I don't have time to do my proper work, the work to which I have been called. And listen to these words. How can I lead people into the quiet place beside the still waters if I am in perpetual motion? How can I persuade a person to live by faith and not by works if I have to juggle my schedule constantly to make everything fit into place? I'll give you another paragraph because it's just so helpful. Pastoral listening requires unhurried leisure, even if it's only for five minutes. Leisure is a quality of spirit not a quantity of time. 
Only in that ambience of leisure do persons know they are listened to with absolute seriousness, treated with dignity and importance. Speaking to people does not have the same personal intensity as listening to them. I wonder if that resonates with you in one way or another. 41 years old, but it's right up to date. I'm sure we get the point that he's making. And maybe you really feel it. And you feel it deep in your own soul this morning. Because you know that your, your heart is so noisy. And your brain is so wired that the quality of listening he was talking about Listening that allows us to, if you're a preacher, allows us to prepare messages that, that, that really do help people, that address where they're at. Or if you're sitting with someone, you wanting to share the gospel with them, or you're ministering to them, just believer to believer. Your brain is so wired, perhaps, and your heart so busy, so noisy, that that quality of listening is not just a challenge, but it feels like an impossibility. You know that you're there, but you, you aren't really there. Uh, in part, some of the blame for that lies with us, and we have to accept that. We're not wiser, we're not smarter in how we live and work, and we, we end up sabotaging our days and our minds in all sorts of ways, but especially perhaps with, uh, with technology and the app and the social media that we have opportunities to use that can be such a blessing but it is a double-edged sword if we don't thoughtfully reflect on how we use those our attention can be splintered into a thousand pieces so easily and actually it's purposely designed to do that so it's not just all our fault it is purposely designed to keep us wanting more and to push us to extremes. You might think, oh, he's obviously a technophobe. <laughs> here's, um, here's a quotation from an internal Facebook report that was obtained by the US authorities when they were investigating them. This is inside Facebook. This is one exec talking to his team or reporting to others and says this, our algorithms exploit the human brain's attraction to divisiveness in an effort to gain user attention and increase time on the platform. They're after you and they're after splintering your attention and they're after promoting divisiveness. Divisiveness that means it becomes so much harder to sit with someone compassionately, listening, without a judgmentalism, without a sense of divisioning, division opening between you. Uh, Facebook is not unique in that, in what they're trying to promote. It's baked into how the apps are built and the algorithms that they use. And my guess would be that you see that. You see that around you. You see that out there in the world. If you're on social media, and I guess who isn't in one way or another, you'll see that divisiveness. But maybe as well you see it and feel it in here, within your own heart, and certainly within the church. But then it's not just a matter of a lack of wisdom, misusing technology, becoming prey to uh, the algorithms that they put there. Uh, part of being human is the desire to be seen and to be known. And there is something good in that. Think of Psalm 139. Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know, says David. Not just you know me, Hebrew just has, and you know. You know everything. And you know me to the very depths of my being. And there is... In Psalm 139, there is a scary aspect to that. Where can I flee from your presence? It is scary, but it is profoundly comforting to know that we are known, that we are seen. It is part of how we are made. But of course, as with every good, uh, it can get corrupted. And it is with us, corrupted into a longing for some kind of fame, we want to be legends in our own lunchtimes, perhaps. 
some kind of prominence in the circles that we move within. And there is a real propulsion towards that today. And we find ourselves perhaps uh, traveling along the road that is more traveled. You need a platform. You need to get your name known. You need to put yourself out there as much as you can. Uh, 41 years in the same year that uh, Eugene Peterson wrote his piece, I left school, did my A-levels and left school in 1981. Uh, I grew up in Bushelli in North Wales, but we moved to Preston in Lancashire when I was mid-teens. Uh, so I was kind of like almost a new boy in the school, not, not ultimately been there three or four years by this time. But uh, the deputy head wanted to see us all individually to talk about where we were going next and so on. He hardly knew me. Uh, he did say to me, I think of you as a tenacious person. I'm thinking, you really don't know me, do you? Uh, but anyway, in, in that discussion with him, only very brief, I heard myself saying to him, Mr. Darley, for that was his name, uh, if you don't hear of me, you'll hear from me. What a thing for an 18-year-old nobody to say. What was going on in my narcissistic heart at that moment? If you don't hear of me, you'll hear from me. Three months later, I thought, I can't live with that pressure. I wrote him a letter. <laughs> so, so now you've heard from me. I, I don't have to live my life that you hear of me. But a product of our times. We're all products of our times. And that is so corrosive in our souls. And it's utterly bizarre, isn't it? That servants of the king who did not grasp at greatness go about grasping at everything we can. It does not compute. And yet it happens. And we don't seem to see that there's an issue there. And ministry, doing ministry, it has a shadow side to it. I've not read Paul David Tripp's book, um, Dangerous Calling, but I imagine some of this stuff is included in there. That we can find that we need to be needed. That's what we want. We need to feel that somehow we are indispensable. We're the ones that no one can do without. But that's not true. And when it becomes clear that actually we aren't all that necessary, things will go on without us very easily, dark things can start happening in the way that we interact with others. Manipulation, exploitation, because we need to be needed. We need to be seen and known, but we're trying to meet those needs in illegitimate ways. I don't know if you've come across the two guys who call themselves the minimalists, Josh Milburn and Ryan Nicodemus. It's a great surname for you. Uh, they wrote a book and they're taking the first part of the title from someone else who said this, but it, it, it puts things in, in a book title, it puts things really helpfully. Love people, use things. Because the opposite never works. Love people, use things. The opposite never works. Well, having set the scene for maybe something of where we're at, uh, I want to just read to you a really short psalm, Psalm 131. If you'd like to turn to that Psalm 131, one of the songs of ascent. Uh, generally believed to be songs that the people of Israel sang on their way up to Jerusalem for the various festivals through the year. Uh, most of them were shorter psalms. It's what you need, isn't it, as travelling songs? <laughs> because your mind probably can't contain really, really long songs within them. But anyway, uh, hopefully you've found it now. Psalm 131. And the heading is a song of ascent, but this one also includes the fact it's of David. My heart is not proud, O Lord, and my eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quietened myself. I am like a wean child with its mother. Like a wean child, I am content. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. I'm going to think a little bit about what David is saying in that psalm, but before we get into the details, I just want to mention something about the placement uh, of the psalm. Uh, it's very common to treat psalms as standalones, uh, and I might dip in and pick up that one. I know it quite well. I'll dip in and pick up uh, another one, uh, and 
we're maybe saying that we think they've been randomly gathered together. And yet, actually, the, the book of Psalms itself immediately faces us with the fact that there seems to be some kind of logic or thought behind the gatherings because there are five books uh, within the book of Psalms. And it goes even deeper than that. The places, how they are placed together, how they're fitted together, is very deliberate and very significant. You know, you're going to miss out on so much. Uh, if you fire up Spotify, put on U2's Achtung Baby, I'm showing my age, uh, and then hit the random play button. Uh, because, well, actually, you won't miss out on much because they're really rubbish at sequencing their albums. But there are some people who, who, who sequence their albums with great thoughtfulness. And if you just play random, you'll miss out on so much. And that's way more serious when it comes to Psalms. There is meaning that is deftly woven through their placement and through their sequencing. Just to digress for a moment, you, you probably know the last line of Psalm 88. It's become very famous. Many people have mentioned it. It's been thought about, spoken about, written about in these last years. Darkness is my closest friend. That's how Psalm 88 ends. But do you know the very next line in the Psalter? I will tell of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known. Do you know where Psalm 88 comes in relation to the books of the Psalter? It's the penultimate psalm at the end of book three. Psalm 89 is the close of book three. It's at least saying to us that whilst we take Psalm 88 in its own right, on its own terms, that darkness is not the last word. It is penultimate. Even when it feels unrelenting, the gloom is not going to be the ultimate destiny of the one who is wrestling there. Well, to come back from that digression for a moment, uh, it's the same with Psalm 131, the calm. The calm that is here in Psalm 131, it flows at least in part from the resolution and the relief that are in Psalm 130. I mentioned on, on Thursday evening on our Zoom that, that this talk follows neatly on from the other in a sense, builds on it, but, but in a limited sense and in this sense, Psalm 130 is dealing with the unclean heart that needs to get clean. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. What's the problem? Well, it's not just the random chaos of life. It's the realisation of sin. Oh, Lord, if you kept a record of sins, oh, Lord, who could stand? But with you there's forgiveness that you may be feared. The calm of sins forgiven. Tasting afresh the calm of sins forgiven. That line in that lovely song of Horatius Bonners to be sung at the Lord's table. It impacts Psalm 131. In a sense, you can't really take up all the blessing of Psalm 131 without having gone through Psalm 130. If we try to enter the world of David in this short psalm with unresolved guilt and unrelieved shame, we won't be able to receive it. It builds on Psalm 131. It's not simply uh, there as a random thing, but then also Psalm 131 is not simply a coda to its neighbour. It has its own meaning its own structure, its own teaching. So we're going to have a look uh, and see what it says. Begins with David's negatives. Begins with his negatives. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. Not proud, not haughty, not concerned with things that are too wonderful for me. Uh, let me just say this is not David's version of the Benedict option. 
Uh, he's not abdicated his throne. He's not laid down his responsibilities. What he says here is not in tension with living a full and active life for the Lord. Uh, David is still the king, after all. This is more about the character of his heart than the contents of his calendar. It isn't saying that this quietness means passivity. It means withdrawal. It means laying things down. It doesn't mean that. However, uh, having said that, that, the image ought to give us pause for reflection because it seems to me that it's often true within evangelicalism that a blur of activity is seen as the only fruit and the only fuel that will ever lead to kingdom advance. It's only extroverts who are filled with the spirit after all. And that's how it can feel or that's how it can seem in the things that we might say. So that there is something to reflect on there, but it's not saying you need to ditch all the activity, but it is getting back to our hearts. And David is saying he's not proud nor haughty. Pride is so destructive, David was no stranger to it. A king has many opportunities to indulge his pride. How many, um, how many soldiers have we got? Let's count them up. Hezekiah, when the Lord has spared him, when he turned his face to the wall and prayed, and the Lord extends his life by 15 years, and then he has representatives of other nations come to him. And what does he do? Guys, do you want to see what I've got in my cupboard? Do you want to see the treasures? And then the Lord brings another word of judgment upon him. We're all so susceptible to pride. David was no stranger to it. We're not strangers to it either. It affects us all and it infects us all. David says he's faced that. And in a humble way, he's saying, I'm not proud. I'm not haughty. Some years ago, I was talking to a man who was 94 years old, Christian. In hospital, he died shortly afterwards. And we were just talking about his life with the Lord, the hope that he had of going to be with the Lord Jesus. And he just reflected on his life, and he, he'd never lived in the public eye or anything like that. He'd been, he was a bricklayer. That's, that's what his life had been. But he was so aware that in his life, there were times when he had been proud. And a look of disgust came over his face and he said, I'm done with all that now. It was a real lesson. How awful pride seems when we're in the light of the Lord, in the light of the imminence of his presence. He could see the, the awfulness of his pride. Well, these impressive statements of David, they deserve to have a place in our own reflection and in our own prayers. Not proud, not haughty. And it's this humility that David is speaking of here. It becomes evidenced in the second half of those statements. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. You might say, I wonder which comes first. Is he saying this is the evidence of not being proud or haughty? Or is this the way to deal with your pride and your haughtiness? You need to back away from great matters, back away from things too wonderful for you. Uh, it's probably a circle. It's a Saturday. Let's just go large. Let's have both. It, it's all of those together. We don't need to get to the bottom which came first in his life. But he is choosing his words, I think, very carefully. A few psalms further on, I've already mentioned it, Psalm 139. David speaks again of what is wonderful. And what he says is wonderful are the works of God. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. And my frame wasn't hidden from you when I was uh, conceived and woven together in that secret place. The works of God, they are wonders. The ways of God with a human being from the moment of conception and growth in the secret place, being made in his image and likeness. David says that's a marvel, that's a wonder. Things that are not known by us, not known to us. Same point is made in the book of Job when the Lord has questioned Job. And Job says, you asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things 
I did not understand things too wonderful for me. Things too wonderful for me to know. We are to praise God for his wonders. We are to rightly ponder them. They are worthy of it. They will bear continued reflection. But we must never think we can penetrate them to the core. The issue of election, faith, human responsibility, divine sovereignty. John was very helpfully saying he's not penetrated it to the core. He's not going to pretend that he has. Wonders belong to the living God. They are his domain. And we're to submit to his providence, not gain a PhD in explaining it. His ways are in the deep. And our home is on land. And that's the reality. That's what David is saying. What we're seeing in his sparse words is that he recognizes and he accepts his creatureliness. And with that, his God-given, God-approved limits. I'm not concerning myself with great matters, things that are too wonderful for me. I am a creature and I cannot penetrate to the depths of the works of the great creator. David had limits and we have limits. Maybe there have been times when you've despaired of yourself. Oh, I wish I had more energy. I wish I had more resources. I wish I had more time. They all seem to be limited. My experience, my wisdom, my abilities, they, they aren't endless. Well, despite everything that our culture tells us, uh, you can't be whatever you want to be. Even today's creators, there's a whole bundle of them around, aren't there? You'll find them on Instagram, on YouTube, whatever. Uh, the term is used of them. Laptops are made for creators and certain things that they will have that makes it easier for people to do their video editing or their productions, whatever it might be. But even today's creators are creatures. That's what we are. We all have limits. We're all insufficient. Uh, Scott Sauls has written a book, Beautiful People Don't Just Happen. And in it he says this, the thing God most wants from you is an admission of your not enoughness. The thing God wants most from you is an admission of your not enoughness. Now, you might want to quibble with the most wants aspect of that. Fair enough, okay. Have a coffee with him. He's over in the States, but if you were over there, sit him down and say, I think that, that phrase needs tweaking somewhat. But don't get hung up on the most wants. Deal with what he's actually saying because it's profoundly true. We are not enough. We were not created to be enough. And our life with the Lord has to reflect that and gladly and happily embrace it. Now I realise the phrase, you're enough, it is intentionally used to lift a burden. Uh, and, and that's right and that's helpful. Uh, in that unrealistic expectations should not be laid upon anyone. And you're enough as, as you are. It's trying to lift that unrealistic weight of expectation. But actually it does need nuancing, doesn't it? Our creatureliness, our dependence says to us, in and of ourselves, we aren't enough. And David is backing away from saying that he's enough here. I don't concern myself with great matters, things too wonderful for me. There are some things above my pay grade. There are some things beyond my ability, my physical, mental, emotional, spiritual abilities. And I'm not agitating after those things. Uh, Kelly Capick has written a book also recently called You're Only Human, and he makes the point in it that it is not due to sin that we're limited and that we are not omnicompetent. It's not a factor of the fall. It's not that in Genesis 1 and 2, Adam didn't need Eve, Eve didn't need Adam. Quite the reverse is the case. It's not good for man to be alone. Is he not sufficient? Is he not enough? No, he's not enough. He isn't sufficient. 
We're made for community. And we're made for community in such a way that each contributes. It's a beautiful picture of the church in 1 Corinthians 12. One part can't say to the other, I don't need you. And then we give to the parts that seem to lack glory. We deliberately give to them more glory. A deliberate choice. Because we are dependent creatures. And David consciously, deliberately embracing it. I do not, I choose not to concern my things, myself with things that are too wonderful for me, that are too godlike for me to handle. There is no heavy lifting that you're required to do when it comes to the secret things of God. Because they're his. They're not yours. When the seed of God's word is planted in someone's heart, secret work goes on. You won't see it. You can't see it. And he's doing his work unseen by us. Whether the farmer goes back to his field every morning to see what's going on, it's under the ground. And the seed springs to life because the power of God is in the word of God. And our privilege is simply to be scatterers of seed, not germinators of seed. The life of God amongst the people of God. It's dreadful that we can think that we, sh- we could write books that say how to grow the church. How to grow an organism that is entirely dependent upon God for its life. I don't think we have that competence. Proverbs 30, uh, Agar, Agir, I'll call him, given that we're in Wales, Agir. Uh, he expresses this in a really beautiful way. Thinking just of human life, says there are three things too amazing for me. Four that I don't understand. The way of an eagle in the sky. The way of a snake on a rock. The way of a ship on the high seas. And the way of a man with a young woman. The way of a man with a maid, maiden. You know, that's even truer when it comes to the work of God. And the being of God. So much about him and his ways we don't have access to that are utterly amazing. David is worshipful in Psalm 131 and we lose the edge of that worship when we agitate to enter places that are not ours to enter. We shouldn't be troubled that there are places not open to us. It's okay, it really is. We can rest content. And that's the force of the image, that actually, that David uses here. The peacefully contented child on its mother's breast, having been weaned. The child that so recently was agitating for food every time it came near its mother's breast, unless it had just been fed and then it had obviously fallen off to sleep. But some babies are like that. The mere sniff of milk. And there's an agitation there. An agitation of body and spirit. And David is saying, I'm like the child that's lying on its mother's breast. And I'm peaceful. I'm still. I'm secure. I'm loving your presence. Without agitating for your gifts. Real contentment, no anxiety, a quiet heart. Growing out of old ways that were suitable for when we were less mature. Now this is a contentment that has to be learned. The child has to be weaned. Doesn't happen overnight. Actually it did happen overnight with one of ours. <laughs> Our third, Anna had to go into hospital. I was left at home with Yola, who up to that stage, who was kind of um, 13, 14 months old, uh, she had only ever been fed off the breast. And so she's in our bedroom at night, and at three o'clock she's yowling her head off. <laughs> I went downstairs, I got her a, 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 some water in her cup and a, and a fromage fray. <laughs> We got through somehow, but it was quite a shock for her to be weaned in that overnight kind of way. 
but it is a process generally. And this learning of contentment won't happen overnight with us. You'll know where Paul speaks about it so helpfully in Philippians 4. I have learned to be content. He says, I've been in situations where I had plenty. And I've had situations where I've been in need. And in and through those situations, he has learned to be content. When he had plenty, I guess what he's saying is, I struggled not to place my trust in those riches. And when he didn't have anything, he struggled not to distrust the Lord and his care and compassion for him. He's worked through from both ends of the spectrum. And he's landed here, ultimately. I have learned to be content because he is in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He can do all things in the one who gives him strength. The words of our Lord Jesus, Matthew 11, are so wonderful, aren't they? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's a process involved there. Learn of me. I'm gentle and humble in heart. Learn of me the character of the Father. He had just said, no one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And those to whom the Son is pleased to reveal him. Resting on the breast of its mother. Resting in the Saviour and in the fatherly love of God. That's where we're invited to come by our Lord Jesus. That's where Paul had learnt to be. And we have to learn to be okay with the fact that there are no shortcuts to this kind of thing. We love shortcuts, don't we? We love fast food, probably. Accelerate Books, a Christian company. Uh, They will, for some of your money, uh, every month give you access to books that they have read in your place. And uh, they'll give you a PDF summary of all the lessons in the book. You don't need to read it. We've done it for you. Well, that can be helpful with some books. Helps you to know whether I want to read it or not. Whether I want to use my money to buy the actual book. But part of the learning is in working through the lengthier statements and arguments. But we'd like everything now. And it takes time. Uh, Wendell Berry. Uh, He puts it really well in a short poem. I'm just going to read it to you and we're nearly done. We ought to be, oughtn't we? Uh, 30 more years. I was talking about 30 years ago, so maybe this has a special resonance. Uh, 30 more years. When I was a young man, grown up at last, how large I seemed to myself. I was a tree, tall already. And what I had not yet reached, I would yet grow to reach. Now, 30 more years added on. I have reached much I did not expect in a direction unexpected. I am growing downward, smaller, one among the grasses. Do you know what he's saying in the last line? My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. But 30 years learning to be content well we need to wrap so um, let me just ask one final question is this going to have any resonance for others in David's mind well clearly yes look at the final verse what he has learned he applies to others individually and collectively as a nation O Israel put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore it's not just individuals Anxious churches, arrogant congregations need to learn this humble contentment. And in our weaponized culture, we best reflect the Lord Jesus as his people and as his people corporately when we let our gentleness be evident to all because we know the Lord is near. Paul again in um, Philippians 4. And those who serve others in one way or another, I mean you, me, We need to try to help others to see and to embrace that reality by the example that we set. That's what David is doing here. You might have come across uh, Peter Steink. 
Steinke, not never was too sure how to say his name. Uh, he's with the Lord now. He was a church consultant in the States. And uh, his big thing really was taking up uh, systems and family theory and applying it to the church. And what became his final book, uh, it's called Uproar, Calm Leadership in Anxious Times. He actually applies what we're seeing here in very unpoetic sort of language, but uh, maybe you'll find it helpful. He said, the leader's self-command, the leader's humility, the leader's contentment, the leader's self-command can stabilize the whole system despite the pervasive anxiety that infiltrates the community. In practice, the non-anxious presence of leaders has a positive effect. It leads to less friction, more imagination, and healthier functioning. How a person handles one's own anxiety, the anxiety focused on him by others, and the anxiety seeping into the system is vital. Since anxiety can be infectious, the leader does not want to be its source or its transmitter. In today's topsy-turvy emotional world, the leader cannot be as anxious as the people served. In effect, the over-anxious leader leaves the system without real leadership. The need for a quiet heart in serving others in the gospel of our Lord Jesus, humble, receptive, contented hearts, it is so significant and David is urging that the people themselves would do as he has done, put their hope in the Lord, wait upon the Lord. John, this morning, let's give God time. Yes, absolutely. Charles Spurgeon said about this psalm, it's one of the shortest psalms to read, but it's one of the longest to learn. Well, recognising that, I wonder if I can just conclude by reading you a prayer that's in um, uh, Jonathan Gibson's compendium, Be Thou My Vision, uh, out just recently. It's a, a prayer of a guy called Jeremy Taylor, and it just struck me as a, a really helpful way, perhaps, just to conclude uh, my part in this time, and then we can chat together. Uh, so I'm just going to read that prayer for us, and we can make it our own as I do that. O oh, Almighty God, Father and Lord of all creatures, you have disposed all things and all chances so as may best glorify your wisdom and serve the ends of your justice and magnify your mercy by secret and undiscernible ways bringing out of evil. I most humbly implore you to give me wisdom from above that I may adore you and admire your ways and footsteps which are in the great deep and not to be searched out Teach me to submit to your providence in all things, to be content in all changes of persons and condition, to be temperate in prosperity, and to read my duty in the lines of your mercy, and in adversity to be meek, patient and resigned, and to look through the cloud that I may wait for consolation of the Lord and the day of redemption. In the meantime, doing my duty with an unwearied diligence and an undisturbed resolution, having no fondness for the vanities or possessions of this world, but laying up my hopes in heaven and being strengthened with the spirit of the inner man through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.